Today's gospel lesson comes from the 25th chapter of Matthew, beginning at verse 14. For it is if a man going on a journey summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the glory of your master. And the one with the two talents came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the glory of your master. And the one who had received the one talent came also forward, saying, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave, you knew, did you, that I reap where I do not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, we're talking about stewardship, and everybody thinks about money, so here's your stewardship joke of the day. But I have to preface this one, because this one may get me in trouble. I'm going to tell you right now, if you laugh, you cannot call the bishop and turn me in. <laughs> now everybody's paying attention. I told this joke a couple years ago, and I ran it by the male clergy of Berkeley County, West Virginia, who all said, oh yeah, you can tell that in church. Then I got home that night, and the late Al Cliff, who was one of the dearest pastors I've ever known, called me up and said, Terry, I told the joke to Jane, my wife. You cannot tell that in church. <laughs> so are you ready now? <laughs> you ready? <clears throat> there was a pastor who graduated from seminary, and he was assigned to a very small rural congregation where the average members age was over 80. There was never enough money to pay his salary, much less any of the other bills, and there weren't people who could do the work anymore. So he broke the rules, and every Sunday he counted the offering after the worship service. Always disappointing. Then one Sunday, as he's counting, there's a pink envelope in the plate, and he opens it up, and there's $1,000 in cash. He stops, and he gives thanks to God, and he says, someone must have had a windfall and decided to share it with the congregation. But the next Sunday, he goes to count the offering, and sure enough, there's a pink envelope, and inside, there's $1,000 in cash. At this point, he starts to worry, because his congregation is elderly, and he's afraid someone might be wrestling with a little dementia, and maybe putting in money that he or she does not have to spare, because they're losing track of things. So the next Sunday, as the plate is being passed, he opens one eye, and he looks around the congregation, and there is a little lady in the back who takes from her purse a pink envelope and slips it, into the offering plate, and sure enough, after the service, when he counts the money, there's $1,000 in cash. He's really worried about her, so he goes to see her. And he says to her, you know, I really shouldn't look at what people give, but I just wanted to make sure that you're not giving so much money that you're compromising your own security. She said, oh no, dear, I'm just tithing. He said, you're tithing? She said, I'm just giving you 10%. My son sends me $10,000 every week, and I give my fair share to the church. He said, your son sends you $10,000 in cash every week? She said, yes, he does. Well, the pastor is very interested at this point. He says, what does your son do for a living? She said, he's a veterinarian. The pastor says, a veterinarian makes that kind of money? Where does he practice? She says, in Nevada. He has one cat house in Reno and one cat house in Las Vegas. <laughs> if 
you laughed, you may not call the bishop. If you did not laugh, use it at your own discretion. There's your money joke of the day, out of the way. Some of you are still laughing, Pat. A parable, which is what we just read, a story that Jesus tells to make an example of something, is like a joke. You either get it or you don't, and it's either funny or it's not. And there's usually some aspect of the absurd. And there is a little bit of absurdity going on in this parable of our Lord today. Because what are we dealing with here but talents? Now, we like to sort of rush to saying that's our natural abilities or things like that. No, a talent was a sum of money and a sizable sum of money. What's absurd in this story is that the master of these slaves entrusts a huge fortune to slaves, and then he leaves town. I don't know about you, but if I were a slave and I was entrusted with a large sum of money and my master left town, I might be tempted to leave town with some of his fortune in another direction, or at least to live large while he was gone. But he comes home and he wants an account to be settled with these slaves. The one who has the largest amount has taken it out and invested it, and he has doubled his master's money. His master is impressed and said, you have been trusted with this. I'm going to entrust you with even more. Enter into my joy. Well done, good and faithful servant. Likewise, the one who was given a little less, according to his ability, also went out and invested and is able to return double his master's money. He too is commended, come into the joy prepared for you. Well done, good and faithful servant. Then there's that other one. Now, he doesn't lose any money, does he? He returns exactly what he had been given. And in some cases, that might be enough. And we're not used to Jesus using such harsh words, are we? He's going to throw him into the outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's a, not a happy party there. So if this is not just about money, because we're talking about stewardship of all of life, I don't want you to think about money. Although, how many of you have an investment banker or a broker or something like that? Lots of folks do. Now, if you went to see your broker and he said to you, I put your money in my sock drawer and you didn't lose a dime. So here's exactly what you gave me. How many of you would stay with that broker? No? But think of it in terms of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We heard, sung, and we read as the call to worship this morning, God saying, my word goes out like the rain and the snow. It waters the ground. Things grow. Bread is baked. People are fed according to my purpose. And I want you to think about the stewardship of the word of God that's given to each of us. Not just the Bible. We gave Bibles away a few weeks ago to third graders. And I wish we would give them to 50 and 60 year olds too because sometimes people probably don't even know where their Bible is. I always love it when I go to see somebody and you can tell that they've recently dusted it off and put it on the table so I can see it right out there in the open. But I'm gonna tell you right now, I am not reading the Bible lately as much as I should, other than I read it every day to prepare for what I do for a living. But I can't tell you in the months that I've been here how many times I have just read the Bible for my own edification. But it's not just about reading the Bible, because if we get the Bible out and we read a story for ourselves, if we think about our own salvation, if we think about what God has done for us in Jesus Christ, and we keep that to ourselves, we are just like that lazy, wicked servant who thought about himself, who thought about his master's hard nature, and gives back exactly what he received. God is not pleased with that, because God wants us to invest everything that we have been given, particularly the message of grace and salvation, of mercy, of a fresh start, of a new life. And it comes through us, God's treasure, just like the treasure of the man in the story entrusted to slaves, entrusted to those that no one else would consider worthy. When I think about my own life sometimes, and I think about the work that I've been called to do, I spent three years, I told you about my call story, I spent three years trying to talk myself out of my call because I didn't think I was worthy of it. And I'm not. People tell me when they come to take communion they don't want to smile or come forward because they don't feel worthy. The good news is none of us is worthy, but the better news is all of us are welcome. 
because that is what grace is. That is what mercy is. That is what Jesus Christ is for us, the open arms of God extended around the world. And so we receive the treasure of the gospel in clay jars because we are still sinners in need of grace just like everyone else. And if we approach sharing the gospel not from a position of power and self-righteousness, but in a position of telling someone where we were before Christ came to us, we have the chance of spreading the gospel in ways that we cannot even begin to guess. I went to Towson University, which was then called Towson State University, or we'd like to call it York Road University, back in the 70s. And I was sitting in the student union waiting for my ride one day, and a group came up, I'm not going to say which campus ministry it was, but came up to me and tapped me on the shoulders I read and said, are you saved? I looked up and said, yes, thank you, and went back to reading. They tapped me on the shoulder again. They said, we want to know if you're saved in Jesus Christ. And I said, yes, thank you, and I went back to reading. They said, well, we want to know how you know you're saved. And I knew that it was only one line that was going to convince them. Do you know the phrase that pays? Because I have accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior, nothing else was going to work. So that was the one thing I was determined not to say to them. <laughs> well, we'd like to know how you think you're saved. Why do you think you're saved? I'm a Christian. Well, but that's not enough. I thought, well, OK then. So then it got to be a little bit of a contest. And they said, we'd like you to come to a Bible study so you can be saved. And I said to them then, what really surprised them, I already go to Bible study every week. I worked three jobs to get through college, and I still went to Bible study every week without fail. They said, you go to Bible study? I said, yes, I'm a Christian. Where do you go to Bible study? At my church. You go to church? Yes, I am a Christian. Where do you go to church? And I said, Frames and Memorial United Methodist Church. They looked at each other and went, oh, and they said, we'd like you to come to a Bible study so you can be saved. Think about that for a moment. But what if we approached salvation not as something we'd earned or achieved? It is not the end of the road, but it is the beginning of a new life in Jesus Christ. What if we approached that from the position of our own need, from where we were before Christ came to us? What if we shared with others, you know, I was a hot mess. And most days, I still can be, but thanks be to God and Jesus Christ that my Savior has come into my life, has forgiven me, has welcomed me, has given me a fresh start and a clean slate, and has put me on a new road. And I have joy that I could not have imagined before. And no matter what I face, just as in that long list of things that John read from Corinthians, we might be persecuted, but we will not be forsaken. We might be perplexed, but never in despair. If we could share with each other our brokenness and where Christ has come to us, the church would overflow with people seeking grace and finding grace. It just depends what we do with it. Now, if you like donuts, anybody here like donuts? If you liked a nice Bavarian cream-filled donut, somebody gave you, oh, we got somebody going, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> somebody gave you a whole dozen, and you decided, I like these. I'm going to keep these for myself. And you put them in the cupboard. What's going to happen when you go back on day 12 to eat donut, if you can eat one a day? What's going to happen when you go back on day probably six or seven? <laughs> oh, stale if you're lucky. <laughs> We're talking cream-filled donuts. You're going to rip that baby open, and it is going to have all sorts of disease inside. It's going to be moldy, and if you've had flies, you might have maggots. It's going to rot. It's not going to be worth eating. <laughs> Aren't you glad I just draw these pictures for you as you sit there trying to worship? I had a grandmother who, my dad's mother, I adored her, grew up next door to her. When she died and we cleaned out her house, we being my parents, not me, every gift she'd ever gotten, she ironed the gift wrap and saved it. Never used it, but she ironed it and saved it. And one thing they found was dozens and dozens of robes and slippers and things like that. 
because she was saving them for good. And you know what happens when you save things forever? They dry rot. Moths get in. They eat holes in things. And so everything she saved for good ended up being thrown away because nothing had been done with it. If we take the gospel of Jesus Christ, if we take even salvation as something very personal to us that cannot be shared, we are missing the opportunity to bring others to the faith that we have found, the faith that gives us life, the faith that saves us, the faith that restores our human nature and restores the image of God, our creator, inside of us. I am a fan of using your good china. How many of you have good china? You know the last time it was out of the cupboard? I was married on the 25th of March because I married a Southern Baptist who did not want to wait until after Easter to get married. I said, but honey, it's Lent. Lent to a Southern Baptist doesn't mean a thing. He thought I was talking about the stuff in the dryer. <laughs> Twice in 16 years of marriage, my anniversary fell on Good Friday, including the last one. And that morning I said to him, I'll make it up to you next year. I have never again used the words, I will make something up to anyone. We have an opportunity now. We have an urgency now. Because the world is hurting, the world is confused, the country is at war with itself over the president and the Congress and everything else going on. We need to set a better example. We need to be the place of healing and wholeness. We need to be the place where the waters from heaven come down. And in spite of us, they grow and they produce the fruit of righteousness for ourselves, but for others. This community needs us desperately. It needs us desperately. So please don't take the gospel as something that was meant for you and you alone. Don't even take your salvation as something that was meant to save you without having an opportunity for you to share with others what Christ has done with you. That is what convinces people. Back in 19... 91, I believe it was, I went to Japan to visit the sites that were set up by the United Methodist Women. I went with a group from the Board of Global Ministries of the United Methodist Church. I visited countless hospitals and colleges and schools, started with United Methodist Women, who with nickels and dimes and quarters had built these institutions around the world in places where women and children were undervalued, where they were not educated, where they had no health care. I went to visit a Christian university in Hiroshima. We met the chancellor of the university who had watched his parents and his grandparents die in front of him when he was a child, the day of the atomic bomb. He shared with us why he became a Christian. It was because in the midst of that hell that had rained down from the sky, he saw in Christians the ability to reach beyond their own pain, their own fear, their own horror, and to care for others. He saw them not lose hope in the face of destruction. He saw them committed to rebuilding their city and their nation. In Japan, Christians make up 1% of the population, but they are considered to be a powerhouse and a force because they are unwavering in their proclamation of Jesus Christ as Lord. Oh, that that might be said of us. Now, I do hope you'll forgive me for my little bit risque humor up here this morning. But don't go home just remembering that. Go home understanding that what you have been given is a treasure. I think so often of Bishop Yackel, the bishop who ordained me, both deacon and elder, who every time before he preaches stands and he's in his 90s and he's still preaching and says, either through me or in spite of me, let your word be known among your people. Let's go into the world saying that with every conversation we have, with everyone we meet, that our prayer might be through me or in spite of me, Lord, 
I'm a frail piece of pottery, but you have placed your treasure in my heart. And I pray that you would let it be known among your people. Amen.